Corrosion – something you don't want to see in your retro gear. When I started making videos, my plan was to get some old hardware from 20 to 25 years ago and cover some interesting topics. Never would I have thought to restore, repair and modify the electronic devices I was so fascinated with as a kid. And although I did have a slot 1 motherboard from Shuttle, I sure wished to have one of the chart toppers like the ASUS P2B. Fast forward 26 years and somehow I ended up with 6 of them, all in need of restoration in varying degrees. If you want to get an overview of all 6 boards, please watch my first video of this series. Today we will work on the second motherboard, which from a visual appearance is the most difficult one to restore. Corrosion found its way to several areas and took its toll on this poor motherboard. I have never restored anything that was even remotely close to this condition. Once I encountered corrosion while restoring a Diamond Monster 3D, but that wasn't nearly as bad. Nevertheless, I'm up for the challenge. Hopefully, we all learned something new during this project, because the commercial value of a working motherboard, contrasted with the time required to restore it, tends to lean unfavorably towards unprofitability. So, we better get some new insights today. I will try to show you as many steps as possible, but I won't be talking all the time. In return, you will get a much longer video. So, then let's jump right in and try to get the corrosion off the motherboard. I started with an unpopulated area containing badly corroded traces and pads. And here is the first lesson I learned. Corroded solder does not melt properly. Sometimes it doesn't melt at all. As if the solder permanently solidified. I was fortunate when a solder blob melted, fell apart into several pieces or broke off in one big chunk. But as you can see from this footage, Sometimes, the weakened pads detach from the motherboard. Even worse, some are ripped off entirely. Everything is weak. The traces, the pads and their bond to the PCB. I am glad to have started with those unpopulated pads. It also gives me a feeling of what lies ahead. And I don't like it. Surprisingly, some of the pads recovered very well and fresh solder formed a nice solder blob on top. The missing pads are a bit unfortunate, but we will not waste time restoring something we don't have to. Before we continue with the ASUS chip, I would like to tell you about today's video sponsor, PCBWay. Are you looking for a way to bring your electronics projects to life? PCBWay offers top-notch PCB manufacturing and assembly services, ensuring your designs are expertly assembled with precision and care. Plus, with their cutting-edge full-color PCB printing technology, you can add vibrant graphics and designs to your circuit boards like never before. Create stunning full-color PCB designs, so your projects stand out from the crowd. PCBWay is also currently hosting the KeyCAD Open Source Design Contest. If you want to participate, make sure to submit your projects until the 2nd of June. And if you want to learn more about the services PCBWay has to offer, please visit pcbway.com. Links are in the video description. The ASUS chip is badly corroded on one side and is missing two of the corner pins. My usual method of applying vinegar was ineffective against this thick layer of corrosion. However, I have a plan. One of the most useful tools for such restoration efforts is an engraving pen. I usually use it for removing solder mask from traces. But as it turns out, it is also very good at removing thick layers of corrosion. Without much pressure on the pen, we can slowly expose the copper legs of the ASUS chip. Once most of the corrosion has gone, I will remove the chip using low melt solder. Then I can try to restore the pads underneath by applying fresh solder and multiple rounds of scrubbing using a solder wick.
The ASUS chip is clean and ready for later when we place it back in its original spot. Unfortunately, one additional pin broke off while I removed the chip from the motherboard. I suppose all those hours spent mastering the art of reattaching replacement legs on 3DFX Voodoo chips will finally pay off. But let's turn our attention to the pads on the board now. Most of the pads are in good condition and accept fresh solder. In the corner however, where the corrosion was present, we can see that some pads have split in half. Pad number 4 from the top is severed very close to the trace, which roots below the ASUS chip once it's back on the board. I doubt that the ASUS chip will make a connection to the portion where the trace is attached. We could attach a wire, but I want to try a different approach I have seen others do. We will get to this in a moment. But let's first have a look at pad number 6, which is also cut in half, with the difference that the trace roots from the other side. In this case, we don't need to worry about fixing the pad. First, I believe that the ASUS IC will touch the portion of the pad with a trace. And secondly, if it does not, we can easily attach a botch wire. So what about pad number 4? How do we fix this? And the answer is, I will borrow a pad from a donor PCB. The solder mask will keep the donor pad in place when we solder the ASUS chip back to the motherboard. And since this method worked so well, I used it to restore a second pad for one of the SMD capacitors. Next, I went around the entire board and removed the solder mask above any traces that looked discolored or corroded. What you can see here looks like rust. However, from my research, I found out that copper cannot rust. It corrodes. One article states that rust is a type of corrosion, but not all corrosion is rust. If I understood correctly, then during the early stages of corrosion, copper turns brown first. In later stages, it turns into the blue and green colors we have seen on other parts of the motherboard. If you know more about this, please share it with everyone else in the comments. Sometimes, traces and wires have vanished entirely. I had to use small copper wires to restore the connections. Copper wire with a diameter of 0.1mm worked perfectly for the smaller wires, but for the larger ones, 0.2mm was a good match. Then I decided to inspect the back of the board. And oh boy, I wasn't prepared for all those traces that needed fixing. But let's start with the elephant in the room. This thicker copper trace is surrounded by residue that looks like an imprint of a piece of plastic touching the board. Surprisingly, only this one trace seems to be in very poor condition. The thinner traces in the surrounding area are somewhat okay. Equipped with vinegar, fine tweezers and my engraving pen of course, I tried to put an end to all corrosion found on the back. 
But this specific trace put up a good fight. Maybe we shouldn't call this a trace any longer, because all the copper has dissolved. Let's focus now on the bottom right corner where the connectors for the front panel are. Extracting the old pin headers took quite a bit of time and patience. And some of the metal pins broke in half, probably due to fatigue from the corrosion. It really wasn't easy to get them and the solidified solder out of the holes, but I did succeed after a while. My vacuum desoldering station came with a tool to clean the nozzle. It is the perfect tool to clean the holes from any residue those pin headers left behind. This area was so badly corroded that there was no point in trying to preserve any of the SMD components, apart from the large voltage regulator and a transistor. I treated both components for corrosion, just as I did with the ASUS chip, by using the engraving pen. But the rest of the SMDs had to go, I couldn't even read their values anymore due to the damage they sustained. Fortunately, I have a couple of those boards that I can use as a reference and to know which components go where. This corner is populated with resistors exclusively. Luckily, I had all sizes and values available. Once more, I had to restore pads and reconnect broken connections using copper wires. Nevertheless, we are getting closer to the end of this restoration with each component we fix. Very soon we will know if spending all this time will result in a functioning P2B.
Unfortunately, before we can test the board, we need to remove even more corrosion. The slot for the CPU is suffering from it too. I did not capture this footage, but trust me, multiple contacts were covered in a thin layer of corrosion. You may understand how bad it was when we look into the socket after it soaked in vinegar for a couple of hours. One eternity later. I used a magic eraser sponge, cut to fill the slot and generously applied vinegar. The vinegar will touch the contacts continuously as long as the sponge is wet and hopefully neutralizes the corrosion over time. I hope this was the last time I see this slot 1 connector covered in corrosion. If it ever comes back, I may have to replace the slot with a different one. Now the slot is clean, but you can see from the uneven contact pins where the corrosion was sitting. We finally reached the point we have all been waiting for. After rinsing the board with isopropyl alcohol, it is finally time to test. We need to know whether it's worthwhile to dedicate additional time to this motherboard, since I crossed 15 hours by now. And that may even be an understatement. And... Oh shit. You probably can imagine how disappointed I was when not a single postcode appeared. But this is the first time we have powered up the board. Giving up that quickly after working on this board for so long wouldn't be smart. Since we got no activity on the postcard and because I had to remove corrosion from the slot 1 connector, my attention went immediately towards the CPU. After cleaning the contacts and reseating the CPU in the socket, we can give it another try. But I didn't expect much. I guess that first failed attempt took its toll on my excitement. Oh. The board boots. Does it? Oh. That is an improvement, but still no success. The board starts with a boot sequence, but gets stuck halfway through. Surprisingly, the reset switch doesn't reset the machine. Maybe the CPU still doesn't make good contact with the socket. At this point, I mentally prepared myself to replace the slot with a different one, but I do not want to think about this scenario yet. Replacements are hard to get, and desoldering a socket from a donor board will be a pain. During the second power cycle, I had a feeling that the oversized and heavy heatsink on this Pentium 2 may be responsible for the poor contact. The CPU tilts to one side and thus may prevent the Pentium to properly connect to the socket. But as we all know, the third time's a charm. This time, however, I will push the Pentium firmly to the left. Hey, it boots. It finally booted! It was the socket connection, caused by the heavy heatsink. <sighs> what a beautiful boot screen. The BIOS version 1006 is the same as on board number 1 when we first powered it up. But the good news is that this board seems to be alive. I improvised and got a little helper that kept the CPU straight. From this point forward, the board posted every single time. When I get to the scrapyard again, I will be on the lookout to find some slot 1 retention clips. As you can see, I already added some colored pin headers to connect the power switch and the PC speaker. But I still need to add the fan header, complete the front panel connectors, replace the third ISA slot and work on the serial and parallel ports. Removing the ISA slot took some time and my desoldering station couldn't clear some of the 98 pins. But that is nothing that can't be solved with flux and solder wick. There was nothing spectacular hiding below the ISA slot that you haven't already seen when we removed the front panel connectors. Many corroded solder joints and clogged holes. I will spare you the details, but here you can see the restored area, cleaned and ready to accept a new ISA slot.
I'm afraid we won't have enough time to work on the ports today. But that may be something for a board that isn't in such bad condition as this one. I'd rather show you footage of flashing the BIOS and booting into Windows. But first, let's apply solder mask to all the exposed traces and secure the botch wires I placed all over the board. Board number 2 tested my abilities and patience. But now I am happy to have accepted this challenge. I've gained a lot of knowledge. And perhaps you have too. Even if it's just learning not to fear corrosion and giving a badly corroded motherboard another chance. In the end, we got rewarded with another working P2B motherboard. Now we are at 242. Before we wrap up, let me flash the BIOS, since as you can see here, version 1006 does not recognize the Pentium 3. Instead, the boot screen shows a Pentium 2 with 598 MHz. And there are more issues in the BIOS. For instance, the V-Core voltage reports an error. The Pentium 3 600 requires 2.05 volts, and it looks like the board delivers this voltage, but the BIOS does not know the CPU model and the required voltage and assumes something is wrong. I got the latest BIOS for this board from the RetroWeb. Like in my previous video, we can use UniFlash to update the BIOS. Once the new BIOS is on the board, we must power cycle the system and hope to see the new version appear on the boot screen. And as expected, the new BIOS version appears. And not only that, the Pentium 3 600 is now also detected and we no longer get an error in the BIOS behind the V-Core voltage. But there is something else we can do to get an even better version of this BIOS. With BIOS Patcher we can enhance the capabilities of the BIOS, add support for more CPUs and fix a few bugs along the way. If you want to learn more about this little tool, there is a video about BIOS Patcher on my channel. Every P2B I can fix will get this BIOS. Once BIOS Patcher finished patching the BIOS, we can flash it once more to the board using UniFlash. The patched BIOS is not only capable to detect the Pentium 3, it can also tell us what variant it is. In our case, a Katmai. I'll finish this video by booting into Windows and see if I can get sound to work with a sound card in the ISA slot we replaced. And that is all for this video. I hope you enjoyed today's content and you're happy to see this P2B working again. Let me know in the comments if you would have expected such an outcome.
I for sure am overjoyed and happy with the results. Next time, we will work on board number 3, which suffers from corrosion as well, but by far not as bad as the board from today. I am no longer scared of you. And finally, a big thank you to all my Patreons and all of you who stuck around to the end. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.